Good morning. I'm glad you can take some time to devote to worship this morning. A few brief announcements before we get started. First, uh, we are going to begin worship in person beginning this weekend, January 17th. Uh, this is due to the fact that there are people who have recovered from COVID. There are people who are getting vaccinated and we are taking precautions necessary to do so safely. And so uh, if you can come to worship from this here, this point forward, uh, you are welcome to do so. These videos will can we will continue to make these videos going forward. We will continue to send out uh, letters with a, a written version of what, what I'm doing right now. So th this isn't gonna change, but you are welcome to join us as we gather in person. A uh, second, uh, this church, the Shelbina Methodist Church, this week is beginning to read to the students of the Shelbina Elementary School. We're doing this on video. Uh, we aren't able to go and read in person, but this is one way we can serve our community. And uh, so we're going to, the teachers will drop off a book they'd like to have read. And I have a list of people who are willing to show up and read. Uh, and we'll make a video of them reading that book. And we will send that to the classroom so that the students can, can enjoy that and benefit from that. So if you are not already a uh, part of that, you are welcome to uh, let me know and I'll put your name down. And uh, when a book is dropped off, I'll, you'll be one of the people getting the email to say, come on by and, uh, and let's do this. Uh, third, I would invite you to continue to pray for our aftercare program. That is uh, the program where we take care of uh, about, a little, about 22 children after school every day. Uh, one of uh, the people helping to run that, one of the staff people is recovering from COVID and some other people have stepped in. Um, this is a, an essential way that we serve our community. And so please continue to pray for the health of both the children and the staff. We read this morning from uh, two places in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 4, we read, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. Then moving down a little bit, we read after the temptations that the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. So this is a story of when Je right, that happens right after Jesus is baptized. And then later on in the Gospel, in Matthew 12, here is a story, a parable that Jesus uh, teaches his disciples with. When an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through the waterless regions looking for a resting place, but it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and live there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I saw a friend uh, when I was out and about. This has been a while ago, but I was thinking about temptation, thinking about this sermon. And I asked my friend, so what is, what's temptation? This person told me about their lunch. They said, temptation for me is a Reuben. Now, Reuben is an amazing sandwich. It is one of the best sandwiches one can make. What happens with this person, though, is this person is allergic to beef. It turns out uh, you, if you're bitten by a tick with a certain type of, of disease, you can become allergic to beef at any time. It, it's a situation that happens, and it can happen to you at any point in life. It's comparatively rare, but it, I, do, I do know people that it has happened to, and this is one of them. And, and so uh, this person knows the joy of eating a great Reuben, but their body doesn't digest beef anymore. And so that day for lunch, that person had had a Reuben. And then there was a price to pay because their digestive system, well, there was a price to pay. And that is the truth of temptation. Like maybe we think of temptation and, and we think of maybe of like grand things, the temptation to do something horrible or evil or wrong or like big things. But I think the truth of the matter is that 
while we do have grand moments and important moments and important decisions that we make, that in those moments we tend to be so ratcheted up and, 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 and like on, on focused that we, we're very aware of what we're doing and we make sure we're doing these things very conscientiously. Right? Temptation is not in the grand moments. Usually temptation is in whether to order, order a Reuben for lunch. And knowing that as you eat that Reuben, such a common thing, it's just a Reuben. But knowing as you eat it that you're going to pay for it. There is an Anglican bishop by the name of Todd Hunter who wanted to know about the nature about, of temptation, wanted to know more about how Americans experienced temptation. So he commissioned a survey done by the Barner Group to find out what are Americans tempted by. What are the most tempting things for Americans? He, he wrote a book about it called Our Favorite Sins. And so here are the top ten favorite sins, well, not favorite, but the top ten most common temptations in America with a 4% margin of error. 60% of people are tempted to worry and anxiety. 60% of people are tempted to procrastination. 55% of people are tempted to overeat. 44% of people are tempted to technology, overuse of technology. 41% of people are tempted towards laziness. Over a third of people spend more than they make. Rounding out the list thus are lying, lust, cheating, and anger. There's no like grand moments there, are there? Uh, we're, no, we're not tempted to genocide. We're not tempted to overthrow the government, to revolt against the world order. We're tempted to worry, eat too much, not do what we need to do because we're on Facebook doom scrolling. That's our temptations. That seems about right. It's the common, the ordinary, the mundane, as mundane as the Reuben that we really should not be eating. Temptation is what happens in the day-to-day -day things, the small things. And these small things, like, they change over time, right? I know that I'm more tempted to worry now than I've ever been earlier in my life. I'm less tempted to procrastinate, but I, I am more tempted to worry, and I'm always tempted to overeat. Food's good, right? So this, this group was asked while this, this was happening, right, how do you resist temptation? Over 50% of people said they just don't. 18% prayed. 10% just said no. 8% focused on something else. This, this sur same survey asked, why did he give in? 50% of people were not sure why they gave in. Right? And so if we want to say something about temptation in America, what we'd say is that it's temptation to the mundane things, that over half of people don't resist it, and we're not sure why it happens. We need to get some clarity on this. So let's look at Jesus. Jesus faces temptation. And the temptation that Jesus faces begins when he is baptized which strikes me as surprising, initially. Jesus is baptized, then he is tempted. Right? We tend to think of baptism as a good thing, right? We, we come to baptism out of a sense of need, a desire to be right with God, a recognition that something is broken. But that can't be all of it. Right? If we're talking about baptism, that can't be everything that happens in baptism. Jesus has not sinned, and there's nothing broken there to deal with, and so that can't be what's happening with Jesus in baptism. If we look at Jesus, it is after he is baptized that he then goes out and begins preaching, proclaiming, sharing, and leading people towards the kingdom of God. Right? We who join him through baptism are joining him in committing our lives to being ruled by God. It's what we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And that's what else is happening in baptism. Right? It is both dealing with what is broken, but it is also committing ourselves to be part of a church family that is on a journey towards the kingdom to come. And so when Jesus is baptized, what he is doing is committing that he is actively following the rest of his life, the path towards the kingdom of God. And it is when he is, has this goal, he is headed towards this goal, and that's where he's going. That is when temptation begins. 
That is at the root of what temptation is, right? To have this goal. Here is where I'm going. It's good. It's important. Here we go. And temptation is, but I could take a nap right now. Or I could overeat. And get, that gets in the way of being able to seek this goal. Or all the small things that distract us from being able to focus on the goal that we're, we're headed towards. Temptation is being committed to something important. Like we are on a journey together. To be part of the church is to be part of a journey that heals our lives, that transforms our communities. That, that's how the kingdom of God is being realized here and now. It's in our lives and in the deeds that we do. And the temptation is to do what is less. Yeah, time to take a nap, have a snack, sleep in. All right, just kind of do whatever. Temptation is to know that there is a high road and see how much easier it is to take the low one. Thus, temptation is rooted in having a sense of something that is good and beautiful and true that we are seeking, we are committing ourselves to, and living in a world that does not share this commitment. What are Jesus' temptations for the 40 days that he is in the wilderness? We don't know. That's okay. He is tempted, and that's enough. When we are tempted, we can know that he was tempted in the same way, and Jesus was tempted to do what he can do, and we're tempted to do what we can do. And that's different. Jesus could do far more than I could. But the, still, the, the nature of the temptation is the same. We are tempted to do the things that we can do that distract us from what we're focused on, what, what matters most. And so how do we as baptized followers of Jesus handle this temptation? It's going to happen, right? We can't say that uh, temptation isn't going to happen. It will. We follow in the footsteps of Jesus, and it is in Jesus' life, he was tempted more than just here at the, the moment of baptism. He was also tempted at the end of his life. And he, when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is tempted to uh, you know, skip out on this whole crucifixion thing. To take this cup from me, if, if possible, right? He just doesn't want to do it, and I don't blame him. That's the temptation, is to take his eyes off of what matters most and to focus on something easier. Temptation is not the same thing as sin. Temptation is the natural consequence of having committed ourselves to the kingdom of God, to living as part of God's kingdom in this world, and, and what happens is we're tempted to do something lesser than that. Now, we're not going to handle temptation by just trying harder. That, that isn't enough. Right? Just try harder to not do it. I mean, it would be more than what half of Americans are doing, which is just giving in to every temptation. But that's still not going to be enough just to say, well, I'm just going to stop it. Right? That, that doesn't work. And so what we find is that there are two broad ways that we handle temptation. The first uh, comes to us based on modern research. The second comes to us based on interpreting Matthew 12. First, when it comes to uh, modern research on psychology, what we find is that willpower is a finite resource. You get that much willpower for the day, and that's it, right? And, and so part of handling temptation is to know that once it's used up, we're going to have a hard time not doing that thing that we're tempted to do. This is part of why when we get to that point late at night, and, and for me, it, it's reading, um, I'll be in the middle of reading a good book or playing a video video game and, and be thinking, you know, I really should go to bed and keep on playing. I'm going to pay for this in the morning and keep on reading. And then I do pay for it in the morning. And uh, yeah, it's, it's at the end of the day. My willpower is used up, right? And so to know that willpower is a finite resource is, is to know that we need to manage it, that finite resource. Like if I know that I'm going to have a meeting in the morning that's challenging, is going to take a lot out of me, that is not the afternoon to go grocery shopping. Because if I go grocery shopping when I'm already somewhat whooped, I'm going to walk down the cookie aisle and I'm going to get two things of Oreos, one to eat on the way home and one to eat in the next two days. And I can do it. I've done it before, right? If I'm not, if I'm not whooped, if I have plenty of willpower, I walk right past that Oreo aisle. But if I'm not, if I am whooped, I will go down that Oreo aisle and I will pick them up and I will eat them. Two sessions. It takes me two sessions. Two sessions to eat a box of Oreos. Once to open and eat half of it. I mean, talk about temptation. That's about as mundane as it gets, isn't it? Oreos. So first, the way we handle uh, temptation is to realize that our willpower is finite. We get so much of it, and we need to be aware of that. 
The second way we, we handle that temptation is, is to read Matthew 12, is to read uh, and help us un understand that. It is one of the more confusing passages of Scripture. Right? We read uh, this parable. It is a story of a spirit that is cast out of a person. And how that spirit wanders, and then it returns to the person it was cast out of and finds that person's house in order. And that spirit returns with seven other spirits, and the person ends up worse off than ever before. This was one of those passages that, that I just kind of skimmed over and, and just was this confused by until I, I became friends with some people that struggled with addiction. And I started to understand uh, the nature of addiction and spirits, right? Addiction is giving in the temptation to feel good in a way that becomes unhealthy. Right? And, and you keep on returning to that. And, and the more you do it, the less good you feel, but you keep on doing it. And, and a, a, an addiction can be to many different things. It doesn't have just to be to drugs. It can be to food, sex. There's a bunch of things we can be addicted to. And, and as I talk to people handling their addictions, uh, I learned of this this process that can happen of people going into rehab and then coming out and crashing and going back to rehab and this cycle happening again and again. And so someone would go to rehab, which is a place where you get cleaned up, right? You cast out that spirit. Like in the Bible, when it talks about spirits, it's talking about the things that are real that we can't touch. And so the, we use a different terminology today. We don't talk about angels and demons and spirits. We talk about mental health and addiction and bipolar. We talk about things that are very real. I can't touch addiction, but it's real. Right? In the same way the Bible talks about a spirit that you can't touch it, but it's real. And so when scripture talks about this moment when a, a spirit is cast out, I mean, that, that's to me like when the moment when someone comes out of rehab and, and, and they're cleaned up and they're ready and they're good. And then they crash because they crash back into addiction. That spirit comes back with seven more and they end up worse than ever before. One approach to reading scripture is to use the passages that make sense to interp interpret those that are more confusing, more challenging. And, and so looking at this uh, moment when Jesus resists temptation in, in the, a, after he's baptized helps me understand how to read this, this parable. Because looking at this, what we read is Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was tempted. And the, and the moment that the temptation ends, like we read this is in Matthew 4.11, the devils left him as angels arrived. I think that's connected. The temptations end as angels arrive. It is not enough to cast out what is broken and evil. We have to fill ourselves up with angels with the good spirits, with the good things, right? Then that might sound a bit mystical, which it admittedly is. It's something getting at who we are, the things that we cannot touch, as I said, the things that are still very real. Let, let me unpack this and see if we can understand that. If we want to live a life that handles the temptations that will happen, it's not enough to cast out the demons. It's not enough to say no to temptations and to clean house and get our life in order. We can't just cast out the bad. We have to fill ourselves up with the good. Can't just get rid of the bad. We got to fill ourselves up with the good, the angels, the spirits of, of goodness, right? Uh, focusing on what God desires. It turns out like when in that survey of people, how did they respond to temptation? 18% prayed, turning to God. Another 8% dealt with temptation by focusing on something else. Turns out that that's a really good idea. The way that we handle temptation is not to say no to what we shouldn't do, but to say yes, but to what we should be doing instead. This is why I think Nicorette works. Nicorette, how do you quit smoking? Do you stop smoking? No, you start chewing gum. You don't say no, you say yes to something different. The way we handle our temptations is not by saying no to what tempts us. Because if that's all we do, we can only say no for so long. Remember, that willpower, you only get so much during a day, and once it's used up, you hit 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, and then poof, right? flop. End up worse off than you were at the beginning. 
We handle our temptations by saying yes to what is better, by saying yes to what is in God's will, by being so wrapped up in doing what is beautiful, in serving others and loving others, in the study of what is invigorating, that we simply don't have time for that which is not. I spend a lot of time focused on the kingdom of God. It's what Jesus comes back to again and again and again and again. Right? Jesus' shortest sermon is, Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. It is where we are going as people who follow him. It is what we pray for every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. It is my hope, it is our anchor, that as we are following Jesus, that that is where we are headed. It's part of why that is so essential to what we're talking about today. By being wrapped up in where we are headed, it leaves little time for anything else. We are only tempted, right? The nature of temptation is that we are tempted to be drawn away from the goal, the good thing that we have in mind. And, and the, the best response to temptation is to get even more wrapped up in that goal and the good thing that we're headed towards. And so I've got to ask, what does that look like in your life? It's going to vary for each person. And it's going to depend upon what tempts you. Right? What are you tempted by? And what is the good thing that you could do instead when you are tempted? What's the thing you can do to get develop a, a, a fascination, a, a, being captivated by the kingdom of God? Prayer, study, service, planning, whatever it is. And if you need to stop the video now and just take some time to grapple with those two questions, I think that'd be great. What are you tempted by? What mundane, commonplace thing are you tempted by? And what's the good thing that you could do instead? How can you join the 8% that focus on something else, the 18% that turn to prayer? What, what can we do? And how might our lives together change if we all were doing this? Focused on what is beautiful, focused on where we are headed, and simply had no time for what tempts us. I don't think that it would suddenly change everything, but it would change everything, one day at a time, because that's how our lives are lived. Mundane decisions, one day at a time, and as those mundane decisions are wrapped up in our love of Jesus and where, where we're going with him, everything changes. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may we be so wrapped up and drawn in by the beauty and goodness of your kingdom, the destination that you lead us towards, that all that tempts us falls away. May your wisdom guide us as we resist these mundane temptations that we face day in and day out. And may we do so empowered by the Holy Spirit, empowering us this day and each day. We thank you for the gift of each other, who we can lean on, who, who can remind us of where we're headed as we head together towards your kingdom. Thanks be to God. Amen. May the peace of Christ sustain you this day and always. Go forth now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.